Let me introduce our first speaker from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, to discuss artificial intelligence applications to the ECG, detecting and predicting cardiovascular disease. Dr. Noseworthy? Hi, so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm excited to tell you all about uh, what we're working on at Mayo Clinic. Um, so I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist, and I'm also the director of, director of our ECG and physiologic monitoring lab. At Mayo, like a lot of big health systems, all of our work is centralized, and all of our ECGs are read by a core facility at Mayo Clinic Rochester, and that's for our health system and for other sites across the Mayo Clinic enterprise. So we end up reading about 250 to 280,000 uh, ECGs a year. We also take care of the Holter monitors and remote monitoring. And for a long time, that has basically been a group that provides a clinical service to our practice. But we're realizing over the last couple of years that we have this large trove of digital data, of ECG data, and it's all nicely linked to our electronic health record. So we can use that information to develop new technologies for ECG interpretation. And there's been some very interesting findings that we've had over the past couple of years that I'm excited to share with you. Um, we're also uh, interested in uh, using this uh, for research purposes as well as uh, to create new insights into what kinds of things we can learn from the uh, humble ECG. So why don't we go to the next slide. The uh, work is supported by uh, a number of grants. A recently completed clinical trial was supported internally. That's the EAGLE trial, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We've had some benefactor funds from various uh, sources, and then some of our other research is supported by NIH funding. Some of the technology has been disclosed and patented, and some of it has even been licensed to third parties. Uh, and I'll try to mention when that is the case, uh, just for full disclosure. Go to the next slide. So ECG interpretation is something that has been part of cardiology and the practice of medicine for 100 years. And it's been relatively static, uh, I would say, in many ways. But I think that there's a convergence of two things, the availability of large amounts of digital data and much more powerful computing technology. And those two things have come together probably more dramatically in ECG interpretation than almost any other aspect of clinical medicine. So. We we're trying to re-envision what the uh, ECG interpretation might look like in the future. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you an ECG. And this is basically a routine ECG. It's actually my own ECG. And our ECG lab read this as a normal sinus rhythm with uh, basically a little bit of sinus arrhythmia and otherwise normal ECG, no, no abnormalities whatsoever. And I was happy to see that, that I have a normal ECG, and I, su I suppose that's reassuring, but it's hardly informative. And there's probably more information hidden in plain sight in this ECG than readily meets the eye. And a simple normal abnormal binary output is not all that valuable. So uh, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the output of some of the AI algorithms that we've developed for EC interpretation. And amazingly, it could say that the person who had this ECG was 37 years old. Now, I was 39 at the time of the ECG, but that's pretty good. There's probably a lot of cardiologists on the call. If you looked at this ECG, you might guess that this was a healthy person, but I don't think any of us would come up with an age with that degree of precision uh, and to be that close to the actual age. It could tell with 98% probability that this ECG came from a man. Um, similarly, uh, although there are some published differences in QT interval and voltage and whatnot. It's very hard for even a very experienced cardiologist to tell male and female from the ECG, but an AI algorithm can do it with almost complete certainty. We sometimes use this actually as an internal control or a positive control. If the algorithms can tell that it's male or female and it gets it correct, it tells us that, there's a, that it's a good quality study and that the AI can learn other things. Now, of course, you don't need AI or an ECG to tell you whether a patient is male or female and how old they are. We're interested in medical conditions, but they could estimate that my ejection fraction is 58%, which is a normal range, that I probably don't have a low ejection fraction, that even though I'm in sinus rhythm here, it's unlikely that I have concomitant undiagnosed atrial fibrillation. Uh, it looks like I do not have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, an abnormal condition of thickening of the myocardium that can predispose to sudden cardiac death. So by turning these AI algorithms on 
what was previously just a normal ECG, it's much more richly informative. We can say something about age, we can say something about ejection fraction, about likelihood of serious uh, uh, myocardiopathic conditions or uh, other arrhythmias. Now, this was, of course, we didn't diagnose any important medical conditions on this particular ECG, but let me show you another one. If you advance the slide, this was another young man uh, in his 30s who uh, had a tragic event after his sister had died suddenly. And his ECG was also read as normal sinus rhythm and a normal ECG. Now you can argue maybe there's some poor wave progression here, but it's certainly not a strikingly abnormal looking ECG. And in fact, our ECG uh, interpreters uh, passed this as normal. When we looked at the AI output, it gave this patient a 76% probability of having a low ejection fraction. And indeed, when we followed this up with an echocardiogram, he had an ejection fraction of 18%, and the patient went on to be diagnosed with a, a familial cardiomyopathy, and other family members were then diagnosed and they got the treatment they, that they need. So if you advance to the next slide. Um, you can see that the AI here was extremely important uh, for that patient and for their family. So when we apply AI algorithms to an ECG, we have basically two main goals. The first is to streamline human capability. So can the AI do what our techs and cardiologists do? So our ECG lab has about 130 ECG techs who perform the ECGs and interpret them. And then we have one or two uh, docs every day who are overseeing lab operations and, over, and signing off on those ECGs and reviewing each one manually. If we could use AI in that process, we could make it a much more uh, streamlined and efficient process. Perhaps the AI could identify, could give us a better first pass at interpretation and do better than the standard off the cart interpretation, making our tech job easier. Maybe you could refine the ECG text uh, reports, find some subtle things that may sometimes be missed. And it could certainly flag ECGs that might require a little bit of addition, additional attention uh, by an expert reader. So that seems like a relatively straightforward thing. Can it streamline human capability? But the other thing is sort of this crystal ball and where we're realizing that the AI can actually see beyond human capability. And that's when we add new value to the ECG. So the ECG is not meant as an assessment of ejection fraction, of course, but these algorithms can turn that, the old ECG, into a test that can prognosticate for things well beyond what even an expert cardiologist can see. So we can streamline human capability and then we hopefully can see beyond human capability. If you move to the next slide, I'll talk about the uh, first effort, which is to uh, streamline human capability. Um, well, actually, um, for the purpose of this uh, talk, I, I'm not going to talk about that because that's a little bit technical. And it's basically recreating, using the structured codes that are within the MUSE system, we're uh, training uh, uh, binary classifiers for each of those codes to create a convolutional neural network that then creates a cluster of codes, applies them to the ECG. And then in our most recent iteration of that technology, we're using the uh, AI called a transformer that takes those individual data elements and transforms them into a human-like sentence and then reads it out so that it looks like an uh, interpretation that a human would have come up with. And we're currently testing that in a number of ways. We're, we're uh, putting it up against the standard off-the-cart read, we're putting it up against our technologist read, and then we're showing the AI read and we're trying to tell whether an expert cardiologist can tell the difference between these three. And it's sort of like a modified Turing test. And we're probably not quite ready to uh, use this in clinical practice, but right now it's getting the primary diagnosis right about 94% of the time. And about 90% of the time, the ECG read is, is indistinguishable from a cardiologist's uh, read. So uh, re leaving only about 10% of the ECGs that really require a very careful uh, overread by uh, expert cardiologists. But I think by far the more interesting thing is to be able to see beyond that human capability. And I'm going to give you three examples of that. Um, I've already alluded to these when I showed you my own ECG. But if you advance the next slide, the first uh, task that we asked the ECG to do was to serve as an ass assessment of low ejection fraction. So if you want to know the ejection fraction, 
of course, you would order an echocardiogram or MRI or you do an LVgram or something. Uh, you'd assess the patient clinically. But we don't typically rely on a 12-lead ECG to give us a sense of the ejection fraction. But ECGs are ubiquitously performed. They're low cost. If we could at least get an estimate of ejection fraction based on that electrocardiographic signal, uh, it could be very valuable, especially in situations where clinicians don't have ready access to echocardiography or for screening applications. We know that there's a small proportion of the population who have undiagnosed low ejection fraction and a screening program to look for those patients if they're undiagnosed and asymptomatic would be very costly. Echocardiograms in people with no symptoms uh, would not be cost effective or feasible, but perhaps it would be feasible to do it with an ECG or even a novel form factor like an alive core device that does either one or six leads. So you advance to the next slide. In order to train the AI to pick up low ejection fraction, we created a large cohort of about 100,000 patients who had paired echocardiography and ECG data around the same time. We then divided it into validation and testing cohorts, and we used the, the uh, derivation cohort first to train a convolutional neural network to pick up subtle changes on the ECG that correspond with low ejection fraction on the echocardiogram. We then test it in a reserved uh, uh, cohort, and what we see is that the models perform very well. We measure the performance of any diagnostic test in clinical medicine by measuring the area under the receiver operator curve, which is just sensitivity versus specificity, a curve like this. And typically, things that we use all the time in clinical practice have AUCs in the range of 0.7 to maybe 0.8. And a mammogram is maybe about 0.8. The CHADS VAS score is probably 0.68 or 0.7 at best. And these are things that we use all the time when we're treating patients with atrial fibrillation. But we got an AUC of 0.93 for detection of low ejection fraction, really much better than things that we rely on every day in our day-to-day -day practice. The next stage, the next uh, goal was to take this outside of Mayo Clinic and validate it in other populations. Because without good external validation, we don't know how generalizable these kinds of technologies would be. So we've looked in populations in Brazil and in Russia uh, and other areas, and it's performing quite well. So we do have confidence that this model uh, performs quite well across diverse uh, populations. If you go to the next slide, we wanna make sure um, so here's some examples of other uh, validation in other clinical settings. So we looked at how it would perform among patients who are coming into the emergency department with dyspnea. We identified all the patients who had come to Mayo Clinic and had an ECG done in the emergency department with dyspnea. And then we compared its performance to things like the BNP and clinical assessment. Here we get an AUC of 0.89, also very good and better than the, B, the uh, BNP, a serologic blood test. Uh, that uh, measures uh, uh, the likelihood of heart failure. Um, and uh, suggesting that this test might be useful at the point of care in telling, in telling a clinician, is this short patient who's short of breath likely to be presenting with asthma or COPD exacerbation, pneumonia, or is it likely to be cardiac in origin or an etiology and then sort of generate the appropriate subsequent testing? We looked in our uh, critical care unit to see how well it performs among people who are admitted with critical illness. These are patients with acute myocardial infarction, uh, acute decompensated heart failure, et cetera, who come into the coronary care unit. And it performed very well with an AUC of 0.83. But furthermore, it actually prognosticated for all-cause mortality among patients who are admitted to the ICU. So you could imagine that simply running this passively on every ECG that's done in ICU patients could give that clinician an idea of the likelihood for in-hospital mortality, the need for uh, echocardiography, and so forth. To go to the next slide, probably one of the most important things for uh, these sorts of models is that we have to be cognizant of the fact that any health disparity that is existing in our current healthcare system could be reflected in these models, and then application of these models could promote or sort of propagate those kinds of disparities. So if we have either under ascertainment of low ejection fraction by racial group, or we have uh, um, 
uh, different characteristics uh, in uh, based on race or ethnicity, the models could break down, and applying the model may fail to ascertain uh, uh, appropriately in different racial groups. So we performed a subgroup analysis by racial race and ethnicity in the original uh, derivation study. What we see here is that there's remarkably consistent AUC across a range of uh, racial and ethnic, ethnic groups, giving us uh, some confidence that the model performs pretty well. Um, even in um, uh, patients of uh, different races and ethnicities. The interesting thing here was that we were actually able to train a model to pick up uh, ethnicity uh, fairly well on the ECG, particularly for uh, black African-American versus uh, um, uh, non-Hispanic white. Uh, it was actually pretty good at detecting that. So it's not that there aren't changes by race and ethnicity on the ECG, but the model performance was um, could see beyond that and was consistent across racial groups. So giving us some cause, uh, confidence that this could be tested prospectively without propagating any uh, bias in the healthcare system. Next slide. So this was sort of an interesting uh, side note, and I'll. The model performance was excellent, a 0.93 for detection of low ejection fraction. So early on, we thought, well, what about if we just added a few simple demographics to the model? Would the model perform even better? And we, if we, so what we did was we gave the model as structured data elements, age and sex. And what we saw was that the low ejection fraction model performance didn't change at all, down to several de decimal points. And at first, that was a bit of a head scratcher for us. If we give the model more information, why wouldn't it perform better? But our data scientists pointed out, and they were exactly right, it's, the issue was that the model is already able to tell age and sex by the ECG. So giving it age and sex really gave it no additional information. And that's where we had that insight that we could probably train a model to pick up age and sex. And um, this was really proof that of uh, the concept that there's data hidden in plain sight in the ECG. I'm just making that point here. So for the detection of male versus female, the AUC is 0.97. And some of these other characteristics, you see QRS duration, T-wave area, QTC, uh, differ between men and women, but none of them approach uh, the performance of the convolutional neural network that is trained specifically to detect uh, sex. Next slide. Similarly, uh, it performed well uh, for uh, age, and you can see that the correlation is pretty good uh, between the predicted convolutional neural network output assessment of age versus chronological age. You see that in the extremes of age, so if you're over 80, it tends to slightly underestimate your age. If you're under maybe 30, it tends to slightly overestimate your age because there's a bit of regression to the mean here based on the ECGs that it was trained on. But we can continue to refine this model, but it's proof that uh, it can actually see age to some extent. We're interested in things like, is this actually a measure, is the AI output for age actually a measure of physiologic age? Are people, would this then be more important for prognostication, for perioperative risk, um, for a number of clinical applications? And we have a number of studies going on right now to see how well this uh, age surrogate performs as a marker of comorbidity or frailty or, 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 or physiologic aging. Um, and maybe we can get away from using chronologic age and use these more subtle uh, biomarkers of aging. Next slide. So when we went through our charts and uh, picked up some of the outliers, we saw some really interesting things. So this was a patient who was appeared to be much older than his chronological age. I think at this stage he was in his 30s and he looked about 55. And every year uh, that he had an ECG, he looked like he was getting older and older. This patient had advanced heart failure. Um, abruptly, after he looked about 70 years old, uh, the next ECG, he uh, looked about 20 years younger. And this was flagged as a case where the AI was failing, but we went into the chart. One of my colleagues did, Suraj Kappa, and he actually identified that this patient had had a heart transplant and, in fact, got the heart of a younger man, and that was reflected on the 12 lead ECG. And it was one of those anecdotal but kind of fun uh, uh, illustrations of the fact that this is a, actually a pretty good biomarker for the age of an individual's heart. Next slide. So the next condition that we developed uh, AI to detect is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and you can advance to the next slide. 
I think probably most people on the call have an idea of what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, but probably not everybody. This is a, a inherited uh, condition where the myocardium is thickened, and over time it becomes uh, uh, thickened to the point that it can cause heart failure symptoms, and it can importantly predispose to sudden cardiac death. And this is a condition that accounts for some unexpected sudden cardiac death in young athletes, for instance, and these can be very dramatic. You've probably heard about patients dropping dead on a basketball court or a soccer field, and sometimes it's related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which can go completely unnoticed, um, but can be a very important uh, diagnosis to make. The ECGs in patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are often abnormal. The voltages can be high, there can be pseudo-infarct patterns, there can be uh, marked T-wave inversions, but there's no single pathognomonic EKG pattern that identifies a patient as having cardiomyopathy, and about 15% of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may actually have a normal ECG. So right now, most societies around the world do not endorse ECG screening to pick up hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and there's a number of reasons. First is that there's a lot of ambiguity in how to differentiate athlete heart from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There's a lot of cost in terms of doing ECGs. There's no standard way to approach how to interpret them. And there's a lot of downstream cost in terms of subsequent echocardiography and MRI. But we thought that maybe even though uh, we as, as a field and cardiologists aren't great at diagnosing this condition with ECG, maybe the AI would be better. Mayo Clinic has a very large hypertrophic cardiomyopathy referral uh, center. So we were able to identify about 3,000 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who had high quality ECGs. And then we created a cohort of age and sex matched controls. We then divided that population into tra uh, training and validation sets, and then a separate testing set to see how the model performed. And just like we created a binary classifier using a convolutional neural network to detect low ejection fraction, we did the same thing here for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you go to the next uh, slide. This model um, performed exceptionally well, um, even better than the low ejection fraction detector. So we had an AUC of about 0 0.97, 0 0.96 in the testing uh, set. So it really got it right most of the time. Furthermore, we see that the model output, which ranges from zero to one, is almost binary. So the model has a lot of certainty when it reports uh, one way or the other. And depending on where you want to draw the line for a normal or an abnormal test, you can create a you know very sensitive test to, to rule out disease or a, or a more um, specific test to try to rule it in if you're trying to avoid too much diagnostic testing. And with that, you can play with, uh, and taking into account the disease prevalence in the population, you can uh, target a particular positive predictive value and so forth. Uh, based on the available resources you might have for screening. So we think that this um, could be paradigm changing in terms of our ability to screen for and identify patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the general population. And since uh, ECGs are done so uh, commonly, why not just apply this model and start to identify people prospectively who may have no idea that they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but in whom making the diagnosis could be very important to them or to their family. Uh, next slide. Um, we looked across a range of uh, subgroups, and you can see that the model performs equally well in men and women. It performs particularly well in young patients, and those are the ones who you would really want to be identifying this disease because it's young patients who are at particular risk of sudden cardiac death and who have the most years ahead for uh, risk. Um, so um, it really performed best in people who are under the age of 40. It performed uh, well in people who had left ventricular hypertrophy, meaning that it might actually help us distinguish LVH from HCM in some patients. And it performed just as well in people who had a normal ECG, so that 15% of the population with a normal ECG, it still performs well. And it, it seemed to do well regardless of whether there was a genetic mutation or not. Next slide. So shortly after um, we developed this model, I was rotating on our clinical service and a woman had been admitted for a septal myectomy. She was only 25 years old, but she had massive septal hypertrophy. And she was actually admitted to have uh, a surgical procedure to take out some of that uh, septum, which was obstructing her left ventricular outflow tract and causing symptoms. 
When we look at her ECG here, uh, the astute ECG readers on the call will recognize that there's a bit of a biphasic T wave in V2, but otherwise it's pretty normal. Sometimes you can see this sort of pattern in young patients. Sometimes it's attributed to a juvenile pattern. It can be seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it's by no means pathognomonic for the disease. Our ECG lab actually had passed this ECG as normal. So uh, I looked at this and I thought, I wonder how the model would perform on this patient. And I thought perhaps it would not be able to pick it up. But in fact, if you uh, advance a slide, she had about a 75% likelihood of having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy based on the model. So the model could see clearly that she had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, even though um, many of us looking at it could not. If you go to the next slide, I rounded on her the day after her operation, and she had undergone a septal myectomy. Her ECG looks, if anything, more abnormal. There's some fractionation of the QRS complex. Those T waves are no longer there. But even though the ECG looked a little more abnormal to me, uh, ST segment elevation perhaps, it looked less to the model like HCM. It only gave her a 2% probability of having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it was kind of cool, very anecdotal, but cool that this patient who just had a large amount of abnormal myocardium surgically removed from her heart actually looked less like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy than she did the day prior to her surgery to the model. Um, and even though her uh, EKG probably looked a little bit more abnormal in the postoperative state. So uh, anecdotal, but kind of fun to see how these kinds of things play out in practice. Can advance to the next slide. The third condition I want to mention is atrial fibrillation. And if you advance, um, AFib, as everybody knows here, uh, can be fleeting. It can be hard to diagnose, especially if it has a very paroxysmal pattern. And uh, you know, if you're if you somebody may have palpitations, it may sound like AFib. You got an EKG, and there may be a normal sinus rhythm, and you may miss that opportunity to make the diagnosis. When that happens, we end up doing Holter monitors and then Holter after Holter or extended Holters. Sometimes we even put a loop recorder in people that we think are very high risk, but it ends up being very cumbersome to try to figure out who might have atrial fibrillation. But we hypothesized that there may be findings on the routine 12 lead ECG present in normal sinus rhythm that would indicate the risk that that individual has concomitant but unrecognized atrial fibrillation. So we created a cohort of patients with paired ECGs in normal sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation. We trained the model to pick up things that were present in normal sinus rhythm that seemed to indicate uh, the likelihood that the patient's next ECG may show atrial fibrillation. This is a harder task for the model, uh, but we get an AUC of about 0.87, about 0.9 if we use multiple normal sinus rhythm ECGs. So certainly better than clinical risk prediction models like Chad's VASC or the CHAR-JF uh, score, which is certain, sometimes used to uh, uh, prognosticate for incident atrial fibrillation. Go to the next slide. The uh, next thing we wanted to do was to validate this for incident atrial fibrillation, and we partnered with some colleagues in our neurology uh, department, and they have a large cohort of patients who are followed for incident dementia called the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging. But it's an older population, and there's a lot of incident atrial fibrillation in that population, and they undergo serial uh, Holter monitors and so forth to look for it. And what we saw is that the model output uh, correlated quite well with the incident of uh, subsequent atrial fibrillation, and it performed a little bit better than uh, clinical risk uh, scores that take into account various clinical and demographic features. So if you had a model output of about 0.5, that translates to about a 20% uh, risk of atrial fibrillation at two years and about 50% at 10 years. So we think that's probably clinically actionable. Maybe we could identify patients who need to be screened with various uh, monitoring approaches. If we go to the next uh, slide, the next question, of course, is it's one thing to predict atrial fibrillation, but the only reason to predict AFib is to, is really um, to predict the risk of stroke. And you can see that the extreme values of high AI output for atrial fibrillation actually did correlate with increased risk of cardioembolic stroke found on MRI uh, in this population. Next slide. Back to sort of anecdotal N of one uh, experiences, but our, our colleague um, in neurology came to us after we had developed this model and said, I've been following this patient who's a well-established Mayo Clinic patient. She's been coming here for over 
30 years, and we have a lot of ECGs. And he had first met her in about uh, 2014 when she presented with what looked like a cardioembolic stroke, but she was in normal sinus rhythm at the time. He put a Holter monitor, couldn't diagnose atrial fibrillation, and opted not to treat her with anticoagulation because there was insufficient evidence uh, to treat, uh, to, to, to try to prevent the subsequent stroke. She then came back five years later and had another cardioembolic stroke, and at that time was still in atrial fibrillation. And he was scratching his head, could we have prevented this stroke? And really, what's underlying this? About uh, a month after the patient came in with their second stroke, they were readmitted with atrial fibrillation. And for the first time, about six years after their first stroke, were finally diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. But if we look back at the ECGs over time, 12 years prior to her first stroke, she actually uh, had exceeded our threshold for a positive ECG, indicating a high likelihood of concomitant atrial fibrillation. So she probably had paroxysmal AFib uh, through all of this time that predisposed her to these strokes. Maybe we could have anticoagulated at the time of her stroke, uh, given her very high AI risk score. Or maybe if we were really aggressive, we could have identified her as a high-risk patient at this time and done uh, more uh, prolonged monitoring uh, to, to identify atrial fibrillation and perhaps anticoagulate. Next slide. So um, our next task is to try to figure out how to translate these kinds of algorithms to practice. And in the current issue of Nature Medicine, the editors wrote a, uh, a piece saying that all of these interesting AI algorithms are interesting, but until we test them in prospective randomized trials and demonstrate that they have a meaningful impact on patients and on the way we practice medicine, uh, they're not of particular value. And we need to hold them to the same bar that we expect for new devices and pharmaceuticals. Uh, next slide. So we have been interested in doing exactly that. Um, this is a uh, prospective uh, cluster randomized clinical trial that we just completed and we're presenting at American Heart on uh, November 15th uh, as a late breaker uh, clinical trial. Um, and uh, so the uh, abstract has been published. Um, over the course of about six months, we uh, performed the ECG on all patients who were undergoing, uh, performed the AI on all ECGs that were undergoing, um, that were being done within primary care. And then we randomized uh, care teams within our primary care practices, either to receive the AI output or usual care where, where they were blinded to the AI output. And about 6% of ECGs done in primary care were flagged as potentially positive. And after applying exclusions, there were about 11,000 in each group. Let's go to the next slide. I'll go over the, the uh, uh, presentation in much more detail at AHA. But basically, what we're able to show is that among patients uh, who were among uh, uh, patients who were in the intervention arm, whose clinicians were given the AI, we were able to pick up additional cases of low ejection fraction and about a 30% uh, increase over usual care, identifying about five new cases of low ejection fraction that was previously unrecognized per every 1,000 patients screened. Go to the next slide. The other thing is how do we get these kinds of models into the hands of patients and clinicians? Um, outside of a clinical trial, do we, can we actually deploy these things clinically? Go to the next slide. Um, I think we may have skipped a slide here, but um, what, I'm, what I'm demonstrating in this slide is that uh, when we think about how to deliver care in general, we think about creating multidisciplinary uh, teams of sort of non-overlapping expertise to leverage all of this uh, um, expertise to, to provide the best possible care for a patient. And what we're starting to find at Mayo Clinic is that we can um, bring AI engineers basically into the fold here. And they're able to look at these problems differently. They're able to unlock the power of the data that we have. And by integrating that into our clinical practice, I, we're able to demonstrate that we can improve the clinical care of patients. We go to the next slide. Yeah, I think that there may have been a, a, a hidden slide in there, but I'd 
before I go to my conclusions, I want to mention that we created an infrastructure to actually report all of these AI models to all patients who undergo an ECG at Mayo Clinic for any reason, and it's embedded in EPIC. So in our EP, in the EPIC tab, where you would normally look at an ECG, there's a separate tab that you can click on, and it opens up what we call our AI dashboard, and it runs all of these models uh, instantaneously and then reports it on every ECG that has been performed within the Mayo Clinic system. And there's been all kinds of interesting cases that have been picked up because of uh, you know, flags for low rejection fraction or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or picking up trends in the data over time. So in conclusion, I think we're demonstrating that these things have clinical utility and you can advance through this animated slide, but we can predict and detect disease and that it's massively scalable by deploying it on various form factors. And I think that this is a big part of what we can do in driving practice and innovation in cardiology. And I think we have a few minutes now for some uh, questions.